Let's go back to that front porch again. This time, my grandmother has the stage. There used to be a woman that appeared under that street light, and all of our heads would go to the street light. And she would walk in front of our house. Oh, by the way, she didn't have a head. <laughs> <laughs> and when she would get here to this street light, she would vanish. Pat, would you go in the house and get me a drink of water, please? <laughs> no. <laughs> I was terrified of going to that old creaky house all by myself. <laughs> but you didn't tell your grandmother, no, I'm not going. But that's what I was feeling. So I got up in the living room. It wasn't so scary when you went in because the light from the front porch kind of filled in. When you got to the dining room, it was pitch black dark back there. When you got to the kitchen, you really could not see your hand before you. So you said, why didn't you cut on the kitchen light? Kids wouldn't know, just switch on the light. Well, we didn't have a wall switch. There was a light in the center of the room with a cord that hung down. And you had to go all the way into that dark, dark kitchen, which felt like a big mouth ready to swallow me home. <laughs> and I had to switch on the light. Meanwhile, my brother would slip around the side of the house. And he would come in and stand by the refrigerator door. <laughs> And when I'd switch on the light, he would jump out snarling like he was changing into Wolfman. <laughs> and I would run through the dining room, hopping past the dining room table because it had claw feet. And I knew that was a monster who lived underneath there. So I would hop so it couldn't catch my legs. And then when I got to the living room, I could hear my grandmother say, don't slam, bam, the screen door. <laughs> I love being deliciously frightened in my grandmother's house. The stories about the headless woman, the woman in the snow that haunted the bus, laughing Lizzie who lived down in the hollow where hunters would often hear her voice laughing and they knew some terrible something was going to happen if they heard her voice laughing. So people didn't want to hear laughing Lizzie. And then she would start laughing and scare us all to death. So I was inspired many years later to write The Dark Thirty, Southern Tales of the Supernatural. And youngsters want to know, are they real? No, they're not. And most of them are made up based on the stories that my grandmother told. The only one that is based on any form of stories that I actually heard as a child was the woman in the snow. And that woman, there was supposed to have been a bus in Nashville that was haunted by a woman. And I wrote that for the Dark Thirty. And then followed that with stories, uh, uh, we call Porch Lies, which is a tall tale. And I followed that up, Porch Lies, Southern Tales of Humor and Exaggeration, told by wily characters. And so it's the companion to the Dark Thirty. And it all comes from those stories on the front porch. It was when my grandfather took the stage, though, that we all sat at his feet and looked up at him with adoring eyes and begged him to tell us a story. Did I ever tell you the one about a little girl with children who went through the woods with a basket of eggs? Of course he had. Many times. But it was never the same. <laughs> and it would change. Midway through the story, he'd add two or three characters. He'd take out two or three characters. He didn't have to worry about reviewers talking about inconsistencies. <laughs> he had three grandchildren that thought he swung the moon 
And so it didn't matter <clears throat> if the language was not on point, standard English. When our grandfather said, now, Dad James, will we go play by the quake? And he said, yes, but be particular. That meant be careful because I love you and I don't want anything to happen to you. That one word, like Missouri, meant a whole lot. Now he could say be careful and it would be all right. That just meant be careful. He didn't have all that other stuff in it. But when my grandfather said be particular, we knew that was very special and that we meant something very special to him. So when he would tell his stories about three children, Sarah, Robert, and Pat, and they went through the woods with a basket of eggs, and along the way, they were approached by a wolf, a bear, a snake, and a fox. Fast forward, I've decided I'm going to tell my grandfather's story. It's the first fictional book I've written. And so I wrote it up the way he told it, exactly the way he told it, with the wolf, the bear, the snake, and the fox, and three children going through the woods. And oh, there was a cat, and there was a dog, too, and grandmama, and mama, and Oh, I just had a whole bunch of them. And I sent it to Ann Schwartz, who was at the time the editor at Dow Publishing House. And she wrote me a letter, Dear Mrs. McKissick, there is a story in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but there's way too much going on. <laughs> It was 16 pages long. A good, a good picture book should be no more than five or six. Push it, six. But I had tried to write a junior novel. I don't know what I was writing, <laughs> but it wasn't a picture book. And she said, if you'd be willing to rewrite it and to take out some characters and zero in on maybe one or two, then I'll look at it. Again, she said, I really like the seeds of this story. Well, when I got it back, I'm loyal to my grandfather. I'm not tearing up my grandfather's story. <laughs> my grandfather told this story to us for years, and I'm not changing his voice. I would not be doing my grandfather credit. My husband said, but Pat, that's the first time an editor has ever written you a personal letter regarding a fiction. True. So I got rid of my brother and sister. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept myself. But who am I going to get rid of now? I got rid of the wolf, the bear, and the snake. And I kept the fox because I liked his voice. I dare say a little girl like you should be simply terrified of me. Whatever do they teach children in school these days? <laughs> well, whatever you are, said Flossie, you sure think a heap of yourself. And she skipped away, leaving that fox fellow to try to prove that he really was a fox before she'd be frightened of him. And so was the birth of Flossie and the fox. It was published in 1986. It is still in print in hardbound, and it is one of my best-selling books. Mm -hmm.